Uh, let's start the session. Welcome everyone to another session in a data R series. Uh, we are thrilled to be here with you this evening for a session full of uh, action packed learning. I am Prashant. Along with me is Abhishek. Uh, we are part of data science team at Analytics Vidya. I'll be the host of this session. Uh, for those who have uh, joined us for the first time, uh, let me just give you, give you a brief introduction about the data R session. Uh, data R session is a, it's a series of webinars conducted by Analytics Vidya, led by top industry experts. It's a fun way to understand the concepts of data science the leading players in the data tech domain and as the name suggests it is one hour dedicated to data uh, we are hopeful that these sessions are going to be a great source of enrichment and uh, add value to our community members uh, now about the session today uh, vijay agnishwar uh, will be the uh, speaker of the session the session is about the efficient implementations of transformers. Uh, it covers the basics. Uh, this session covers the basics of transformers, which are attention-based deep neural networks. It will also mention some of the applications of transformers, uh, where they outperform CNNs and other deep neural networks. The data are also covers our survey of recent work in implementing efficient transformers. I hope you are excited to attend this uh, data hour on efficient implementations of transformer with us. Uh, before we kick off the with the session, uh, kick, a quick recap of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording this session and uh, we'll make uh, this recording available in a few days uh, on your YouTube channel. And the link will be shared uh, at the end of uh, this channel, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, for the YouTube channel. And if you have any uh, questions, you can uh, use the Q&A section for asking uh, questions and uh, we'll do our best to answer them as the session progresses. And if the time uh, does not perm permit, uh, we can uh, have the questions at the end of the session. And we'll also share a feedback poll towards the end of the session. Uh, I, I request you to kindly participate in now, uh, uh, I will give a brief introduction of our speaker. Uh, Vijay Agnishwar has an MS for, from IIT Madras in 2001 and a PhD from IIT Madras. He has spent last 20 years creating intellectual property and building products in uh, cloud computing, big data, and machine learning areas. He has several papers, including IEEE transactions, and has five full granted US patents on his name. He is currently head of Cloud Plus AI research team at Microsoft Bangalore. He was heading the ML platform and data science foundation team at Walmart previously. Uh, okay, let's start the session. Over to you, Vijay. Uh, start hey, thanks, the... sir. You can hear me, right? Yeah, yes. Cool. Thanks. We can start. Right, folks. Sorry. Uh, we can start the session. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, and, and welcome folks. Uh, uh, glad to be speaking here and uh, with you on uh, some of the work we have been doing on uh, transformers. So, so uh, what I'm intending is to um on a second yeah okay got it yeah yeah okay cool yeah the idea is to um give a brief view of uh, uh natural language processing and especially focusing on how deep learning has helped nlp and uh, uh, you know, with, with respect to that, right? So we'll focus on that aspect and then uh, give an intro to transformers themselves. So I'll start from the basics and try and uh, uh, explain, right? What are transformers and how they work? 
and then um, go on to a little bit about a survey that we have done recently on efficient implementations of transformers and uh, you know uh, detail out uh, the survey to some extent um, and then a uh, little bit on um, what are the limitations of ai in general and uh, where is it headed right that, that kind of uh, futuristic uh, uh, few few um, thoughts on that and then uh, to kind of end, end our session right so that's the plan so um, so we'll start with some of the text modeling uh, aspects right so see a, a review like this right which is um, um, what you normally get right on uh, uh, many of the e-commerce platforms the amdb and all that right so um so if a machine is to process this right um, not so easy right it turns out especially these kind of reviews right and uh, uh, reviews where for instance the person is saying this was a great product it was uh, it is excellent in all respects and the last line says i'm a liar or something like that right i'm a compulsive liar and uh, things like that right that kind of flips the whole review and then um, however, it's easy for a human to actually understand some of these reviews, but for a machine, it turns out that it's not so easy, right? So we'll see why, because typically, right, the method that is used to um, process, right, some of these uh, uh, text uh, um, uh, paragraphs or sentences, as you may call it, right, uh, is to, you know, uh, the, the traditional one is called the TF-IDF. Uh, where, uh, you know, you look at the uh, different words that are occurring and uh, how many times they are occurring and uh, kind of uh, figure out, for example, that um, some of the words like uh, incredibly bad and, you know, or uh, have a negative connotation and then whereas nice and others have a positive connotation and you kind of build the overall count of how many um, words or you know, towards a positive sentiment and whereas you also look at how many words are having a negative sentiment and then kind of tell finally, right, that the overall sentiment is in a certain uh, direction and things like that, right. But as you can see, right, in a review like this or like the one I said where uh, everything is positive and only the last line says I'm a liar, right. In these kind of reviews, such an approach wouldn't really work, right, because though uh, the, the number of positive words are more, but it turns out that, um, uh, you know, the, the review is actually uh, negative, right? So uh, then, then, of course, the other uh, approach is to try and do what's known as a word embedding. So where you um, can, can um, um, create uh, embedding for the words using different approaches, right? Could be word to vec or fast text or glow. And then uh, use that embedding to, um, you know, see the ideas, though the um, embedding, you, you're still looking at, um, you know, words independently and trying to see, right? a uh, little bit around the word what has happened and uh, so the, the context is what you get from the embedding um, so so though there is a little bit of context involved you are still right looking at only the word level and uh, uh, harder to uh, uh, again do for the kind of uh, reviews we were talking about right e even the word embedding is not going to help so this is where, right, uh, sequence modeling through deep learning has helped and uh, uh, typically, right, your uh, convolutional networks or the uh, long short term memory networks, uh, as they are called, right, the LSTMs or the CNNs have been used, uh, especially in the recent past, and these have given uh, significant uh, uh, benefits, right, for uh, text, uh, especially uh, text processing and sentiment analysis and the different kind of tasks that we talked about, right. So this kind of gives a quick view of how a CNN would do a sentence classification. So, so see in, in a convolutional uh, network, right? The, uh, you know, typically the um, 
there is a convolutional layer right which uh, um, acts as a filter and kind of goes through um, parts of the text right so essentially you will end up with uh, uh, multiple filters right uh, at the second layer which is your convolutional layer and uh, of course at the first level you will simply represent uh, the um, sentence right in the form of n by k representation and uh, right and then you uh, look at the uh, filters right the convolutional filters uh, and typically right what you will do is you will start um, doing an n gram of the sentence right? so you might start start grouping um, two words at a time and or or three or four depending on what is n and then you will then see um, so so the filter width would be you know would be uh, the the n gram size and then um, uh, basically it, uh, gives you the feature map so which means what are the essential um, or the top ranking features right within each filter is what you end up with in the feature map and then doing a max pooling right will then give you the feature which has maximal influence right over the for example if it is a sentiment that you're trying to achieve right or a text classification you're trying to do right um, so what's the maximal influence on the task at hand uh, and and that's what is your pooling layer going to give you and your final uh, uh, layer would be a typically fully connected layer which is typically a feed forward kind of a network which will simply do the classification uh, task right at, at the last step so these are typical ways of uh, uh, you know being able to leverage a convolutional uh, neural network for sentence classification and and the uh, reference is given right there so that this is uh, one of the classical approaches that uh, deep learning has helped and it has turned out that uh, um, the uh, tasks like sentence classification as well as uh, um, sentiment analysis right um, CNNs do perform well and um, see, especially for uh, sentences where uh, a few key uh, words drive the sentiment, right? And, and the kind of uh, sentiment, the sentences we were looking at, right? Including uh, the, the ones where, you know, the, it, it, it flips and talks about a liar and things like that, right? Those will be handled well, right? By a CNN. Um, and of course, there are uh, a few issues with the pooling, so which is uh, you know the the max pooling as we had called it, um, because as you can see here, right, where I've illustrated what happens in a pooling layer actually, right, the max pooling layer. So, for example, a two cross two uh, max pooling would be something like this, where uh, each of the two cross two. Um, uh, matrices right within the overall uh, uh, matrix representation of the sentence right is going to be uh, you know looked at and you will end up with the max within that uh, two by two grid right so you you are ending up for example in uh, this grid right you're ending up with 20 and with this grid you're ending up with 30 and in this with 112 and so on right so the the uh, issue is uh, while this works well for uh, cases where you know the sentiment is driven by those few uh, keywords. Um, however, the um, issue is that some spatial information is especially lost. So where um, you uh, cannot figure out, right? For example, where was uh, the, this uh, twenty coming from, right? Uh, within this four. Uh, 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 parts of the grid, you, you you will not be able to keep track of that. So that's why I'm saying spatial information is uh, lost. So that's one of the issues. So which uh, results in certain complications, right? So for example, um, uh, CNN um, solves for invariance, as we say it, right? Uh, not for equivariance. So what this means is the um, uh, the, the CNN becomes uh, uh, very sensitive to um, uh, image perturbations, right? For example, if I were to uh, perturb the image, right, and uh, talk about, um, for instance, uh, rotate the image or give a different lighting or change a background color and 
uh, and, and in all of those cases, right, then the um, CNN would, would be unable to dis disentangle the transformations to the image and it would uh, kind of fail, right, in most of those cases. Um, so, so and, and of course, like we saw previously, right, where we are talking about the max pulling operation, losing spatial information, right, that also has the problem. So what would happen is that the, um, you know, questions like uh, saying, you know, is there a cat in the image, the CNN would answer well, but questions like, is the cat to the left uh, of the image or to the right of the image or in the center of the image, or is the cat looking at us and questions like those, right, where uh, a little bit of spatial information is involved, right? CNN wouldn't be able to answer well. So, so that becomes a bit of a challenge, right? So uh, that's one of the things we say, right? That uh, um, CNN solve, solves for invariance and not equivariance. The capsule, net, capsule networks, as they are called, right? Or, or a recent uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, deep neural nets, which have been proposed and which do work in this context, right? Where uh, they, they can, um, uh, they solve for equivariance and they are able to actually um, not lose the spatial information, which the max pooling operation, right? And, and consequently, the CNNs will lose that spatial information, right? Which a uh, capsule network wouldn't lose. However, I'll kind of not delve too much into capsule nets because uh, the, the focus of our uh, talk is different. So just to kind of summarize, right, where we are and uh, what are the approaches for uh, natural language processing, right? the uh, uh, word embeddings are the first level and uh, however the um, for example a river bank right whether it's a, um, or, or a bank as we say it right whether it's a river bank or a financial institution it is no e easy way of distinguishing those and uh, what's called as polysemy right cannot be handled uh, whereas the CNN will be able to handle those and uh, uh, however, the issue is, uh, um, like we said, right, few things in the CNN, but with respect to text data, the uh, manifestation of the deficiencies of CNN is that it may handle, it, it may not handle long distance dependencies where, um, uh, for example, you know, there is a long sentence, right, the first word says that, uh, you know, uh, this person is in France. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, different things. And finally saying the language he spoke was dash, right? And if the CNN had to complete the sentence there, that depends on France, which was coming uh, much earlier in the paragraph, right? So that kind of a longer dependency is there. Then the CNN has trouble in handling those. So which, um, uh, you know, would... Uh, uh, you know, be, be a little troublesome in certain uh, contexts, right? Um, so so the uh, there were other uh, kind of neural nets which have been proposed like the uh, RNNs and the LSTMs, which do handle this uh, long-term dependency to some extent. But however, the issue there is uh, um, the lack of parallelism and uh, then the memory bottleneck would, would always be there and, uh, you know, you may end up with... Uh, some issues, so which we will see, right, as we go on, right? Um, so just to um, check, right? Um, okay, so we will come back to some of these questions as we um, go along. Um, so just wanted to check on, uh, yeah, yeah. So so the uh, issue in uh, uh, the recurrent neural networks, the RNNs as they are called, right? which uh, uh, kind of this is an uh, enrolled uh, 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 RNN, right? Where though there would be a, just a recursive connection, right? But the recursive connection is not shown and, you know, it's kind of unrolled and, you know, you're seeing the sequential connection here. Um, so, so here the, um, uh, the uh, uh, advantage is uh, the, the, it, it does very well for uh, uh, sequential modeling. And of course, it can handle um, the, the dependencies which are in the neighborhood quite well. But again, the uh, long-term dependencies may still be a problem here. And also, uh, there is a memory bottleneck, right, where uh, it, it cannot handle, uh, you know, as the sequence length keep, keeps on increasing, right? The RNN will have trouble. 
and so that's why we say right there is a memory bottleneck in uh, uh, the uh, recurrent uh, neural nets and and also the uh, other thing is um, this is inherently uh, sequential so so the um, each of these steps right the um, steps of the sequence and the processing of the uh, words in the uh, input right would have to happen in uh, serial order and uh, kind of limits the parallelism that is uh, uh, you know otherwise possible and uh, this may uh, complicate things uh, especially you know for larger data sets and wherein the training time could increase significantly and uh, so so those would be some of the uh, limitations right of rnns so this is where the uh, attention mechanisms come in right where uh, the the transformers right the key idea behind transformers is of course the attention mechanisms which uh, uh, as we will detail in the next few slides right it kind of removes the information bottleneck that we were talking about right that the memory issue uh, you know um, so so essentially right what it means is the rnn right um, will find it difficult to give access to the whole input uh, whereas it may give access to just the neighboring um, words, right, of where it is processing at that point of time, right? Whereas uh, sometimes you may need the whole input to be uh, accessed, right, at, at a point in time. Um, so this is where, right, uh, the attention mechanisms come in. And uh, as we will see, it, it helps to uh, get access to the whole input. And of course, like, uh, you know, what is there in the uh, human brain and the uh, vision of uh, humans, right? We focus on uh, what is important, right, at any point of time very quickly. And uh, so, so that's what is the uh, attention mechanism trying to get inspiration from and trying to uh, figure out what are the words that are important, right, at any point of time, right, when a particular word is being looked at, right, in the input sequence, right? And of course, there is a specific query mechanism to decide what data is important at this point of time. And it kind of provides us with attention weights, right, to uh, at any point in time. So which kind of gives us an interpretation of what's going on. See, in general, one of the uh, issues has always been that, uh, uh, especially in deep learning, right, it's not very interpretable and, uh, you know, figuring out why uh, you know the uh, network has certain results becomes uh, challenging right so this is one of the things that uh, attention mechanism can address and uh, give some interpretation of what's going on right um, so so there are different kinds of attention mechanisms depending on uh, um, so how you look at the three things right so there are keys values and the query right so, so query is your um, 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 typically right the the input right and the key uh, will would also be uh, input but uh, input from a previous time step and so on right that we will see and and the value right would be um, again uh, you know depending on what kind of uh, recurrent uh, mechanism we are talking about right uh, will vary. And sometimes keys and values will be equal to the input sentences and uh, you know the query will be just the word that we are looking for at that point. And so essentially right the attention value will uh, uh, is, is kind of a mapping right of the query to a set of uh, key value pairs uh, and, and based on the set of key value pairs it maps to an output right which is the attention value right. So, so the way to calculate the attention is to uh, take a uh, query key pair and compute the similarity and obtain a weight and the similarity could be a dot product or a splice or a detector and so on right and then use a softmax function to normalize the weights and uh, um, you know weight the ways uh, you know with corresponding values to then obtain the attention uh, at, at any point in time so this is a typical recurrent attention network uh, there are other forms of attention, right, where, for example, self-attention is there, which is also quite popular and, uh, uh, you know, has been in use, where uh, the keys and values are, uh, uh, again, the input sentence, right, coming from the input sentence. The query, however, is the current step in the input sentence. And then it calculates the attention value at each step, 
So essentially, right, this diagram kind of captures it at some point, right, where the um, circled blue, right, is where the uh, processing is happening at that point. And then the red ones are, uh, you know, the, the ones where attention uh, has to be maximal and so on, right? So this kind of gives uh, an, some idea, right, of uh, uh, what would happen when the sequence of uh, words is being processed and where can the attention, right, needs to be focused on, right? And, and that's typically, right, what attention mechanism gives, right? The ability to focus on a set of words, right? Uh, for for any given uh, word that we are processing right from the input sequence right um, so so yeah the uh, like I said right there are different attention mechanisms depending on uh, you know what the key values and the queries are right so like I said in recurrent attention the um, you know hidden state right would, would be the uh, query whereas the keys and values will be the input sequence and which is pretty much the same in uh, even other forms of attention, including self-attention and learned self-attention. Just that in self-attention, the query becomes the current input and uh, uh, whereas the query will get learned in, in a learned self-attention kind of network. Um, so so um, in, in practice, right, the way attention would uh, kind of uh, get reflected will be in this form, right? Uh, like I said, right, where um, you know, you end up, uh, you know, with a, a set of key value pairs and then uh, the query, which uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, you kind of map the uh, query to a key and uh, figure out the value, right, which is closest to that key. And then that gets extracted. And then um, there's a softmax for uh, uh, kind of, you uh, um, uh, you know, which uh, helps in um, regularization, right? And then, of course, you will uh, uh, finally this kind of the attention weights are there and which gets captured with the values to actually get the attention value, right? Um, so, so uh, there could be different uh, similarity functions like we discussed, right? Could be a dot product or a perceptron or a, a concatenation function and so on. And then um, uh, the, the transformer uh, architecture will be uh, based pretty much on the attention uh, network, what's known as multi-head attention, right? Where there are multiple heads of attention and each of them, uh, you know, you can think of it in terms of a pipeline that is there, which the different heads are looking at different parts of the uh, input sentence and hopefully in parallel. So which gives uh, a certain, uh, uh, ease of implementation, right, where uh, uh, the, the parallelism will help it uh, get implemented more efficiently, right? Uh, and of course, you have the um, uh, normalization layers and then, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the input embedding is, of course, where it starts. There's something called a positional encoding, right, which uh, is necessary because uh, otherwise the uh, transformer will kind of lose uh, um, the, the positional information, right, in terms of uh, uh, where the word is, uh, right, and because it has access to the whole input, right, it's likely to lose the positional information. So there is a specific uh, different forms of positional encoding that can be used. But yeah, that will kind of take care of uh, uh, the position and uh, make sure, right, that the order of the words can be looked at by the transformer, right. So. Um, transformers, right, have uh, uh, been used in number of applications, right? Including, uh, for example, text processing. Uh, they've been used in vision quite a lot, computer vision, right? Where um, they've made a, a, what's called as vision transformers, right? They've made a huge difference in, uh, uh, you know, the, the ability of machines to process uh, 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 textual, the, the uh, visual information and uh, so on, right? So most of the um, self-driving cars that you see, right, are uh, where, um, uh, you know, the uh, cameras are used and then th there would be some form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, transformers there, which are going uh, um, to be able to classify the uh, images coming in uh, at, at that point, right? Uh, and, and similarly, right, the uh, speech uh, uh, technology again has uh, benefited a lot from transformers and um, you know, many, many of the speech recognition uh, softwares that you see, including the ones on your phone and 
where you're able to talk to your Google Assistant or your uh, um, Siri, right? All of that uh, uh, possibly, right? Many of them at least, right? Uh, uh, do use transformers, right? Um, so, so yeah, we have seen a number of applications of uh, transformers and uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is to uh, delve a little bit into a little bit of survey that we have done, right? Um, so, so uh, these are uh, papers that have appeared in the recent past and uh, this is like state of art survey, right, that we have done. And, and there are different categorizations, right, as we have seen, right, where uh, or different dimensions along which we have categorized the uh, transformers. And see, one of the main things is that to understand is that the, um, though we have, we are saying that transformers, uh, you know, are able to handle the uh, long range dependencies, right? Which uh, typically your uh, uh, CNNs and RNNs may struggle with, right? Transformers are able to handle those kind of long range dependencies quite well. See, primarily because they have access to the whole input, right? Like we saw, right? They have access to the whole input at, at any point of time. Whereas a CNN or an RNN would not be able to do that. And they will have a small restricted neighborhood, right? Within which they can, uh, uh, you know, span that tension. But here, attention could span the whole input and possibly, right? Or, or at least different parts of the whole input and so on. So transformers are able to do that. However, the complexity is that the... Um, so it becomes order of n square, right? In terms of uh, where n could be the input sequence length. So the uh, computational complexity of transformers is typically order of n square. And this causes uh, a lot of difficulty. And uh, again, the memory uh, limitations are also there. Uh, for example, your typical BERT and uh, you know your common transformers like BERT and GPT, right? Uh, won't be able to handle beyond 512 uh, uh, sequences, right, in, in the input. So there would be a need to break down your input into uh, multiple sets of uh, uh, things and so on, right? So, so, uh, so, so those are some of the um, complications, right, that people have addressed, right? And, and in recent uh, work, right, especially with respect to computational complexity, there have been several uh, papers that have tried to address the computational complexity of uh, uh, transformers and uh, the prominent among them will be, for example, your uh, performer from Google or your Linformer, which is a linear uh, uh, transformer and then Big Bird, right? Also a famous one, uh, which uh, uh, have, uh, uh, see, they, they try to address in different forms, right? Uh, for example, Big Bird would address in a certain way uh, whereas, uh, you know, Linformer would address it in a different way and so on. But essentially, all of them uh, trying to, for example, sparsify the input and uh, address the uh, sparse matrix in different forms to um, right, process that matrix faster. Right? So essentially, it's about that. So uh, different uh, uh, papers in this, uh, the computational complexity dimension address it differently but they all end up uh, uh, addressing the computation complexity, right? Uh, in, in different forms and, uh, you know, help in uh, uh, implementing transformers efficiently. And then if you look at, uh, um, you know, the approximation dimension, right? There, um, there are quite a few uh, which have come in the recent past and um, uh, where uh, the, the, for example, there could be, um, you know, uh, solutions to partial differential equations or even ordinary differential equations, which people have taken those and then um, use those to actually implement transformers. But then the only challenge is those transformers are not exactly, uh, you know, the, the same in, in terms of uh, accuracy. And uh, so they, they are what are known as approximate transformers, right? So. Um, so they have been uh, implemented in the recent past and uh, for example, your uh, uh, many trans evolve, for example, right, is, is a work from the Indian Institute of uh, Science, Bangalore, where they have looked at, uh, uh, you know, from, from uh, you know, drawing inspiration from particle dynamics and trying to uh, implement an approximation of uh, transformers, right. So, so there is a little bit of trade-off there where, uh, for instance, a little bit of uh, accuracy is sacrificed 
for performance but then um, uh, this is typical case and uh, where um, uh, the trade off uh, is always there because uh, if you want you know the the maximal accuracy then um, you know you you pay a cost in terms of computation and uh, uh, time overheads right but then if that can be offset a little bit then uh, you know you can gain uh, significantly in terms of performance but you will have to sacrifice a little bit of uh, accuracy and uh, right so so that trade off is always there and then of course there are other aspects that people have recently looked at right in and uh, of course the um, their model compression is there and um, for instance people use uh, uh, quantization or other techniques to compress the uh, transformers and then uh, you know have them implemented fairly efficiently and uh, yeah there could be pruning or quantization or other techniques people have uh, leveraged right so many of these papers address that which are in the model compression uh, dimension and then uh, uh, what has been of interest especially for us right uh, we have tried to look at uh, the the dimension called spectral complexity right where uh, uh, for instance we look at the uh, input uh, image as a signal and then try and uh, um, for example uh, use some of the signal processing techniques like for example your fourier transforms to um, so there is one called fnet which is actually right replaces the attention mechanism of transformers with a fast fourier transform right so so there have been some efforts in this direction and which is of interest for us because we have come up with a a, a new um, um a transformer you know uh, or or yeah based on what we call as a spectral um, neural operator right sno it's called so so there are uh, other efforts that have been done in this recent past and so essentially right the idea is to kind of um, look at the input signals in terms of uh, you know can we uh, leverage uh, signal processing techniques like your fourier transforms or you know maybe other technique fourier series or taylor series and so on right and then try and uh, uh, leverage that to kind of uh, process the signal more efficiently for instance in some cases you may end up in um, um, uh, splitting the signal into the low pass and high pass components and so one of the characterizations right that has uh, been helpful is that uh, for example the um, transformers act as uh, uh, low pass filters whereas your um, convolutional networks may act as high pass filters so so a characterization like this has helped where uh, um, now even we are looking at you know in our research trying to see if we can augment transformers right with uh maybe a high frequency or a uh, you know high frequency component which can handle uh, you know some of the high frequency components well so what this will mean is that the transformer will then work in cases where uh, you know there is lower data uh, availability and so on right whereas typically transformers do need uh, you know high availability of data right so Uh, so the, so this survey is going to be interesting we have a blog um, that's going to appear in the next few days and uh, you know on this and uh, yeah survey papers are also been written and uh, you know we'll be sharing some of those as we go along and then uh, of course the um, another interesting um, uh, you know work right in the recent past has been uh, to performance benchmark transformers right see typical benchmarks have looked at glue benchmarks or the uh, image net and so on right for images right but there is one which i would like to talk about right which uh, is is known as the long range arena the lra benchmark and this is actually significantly uh, new and uh, but but uh, quite important because what's happening is uh, many of the state of art transformers right are reporting the results on the lra benchmarks and there are a few tasks here like like what's listed here right like your list stops or uh, byte level text classification and byte level text retrieval right as well as image classification and uh, two last two tasks known as pathfinder and pathfinder x are interesting because what they are doing is to uh, take an, uh, an image and where there are two points and then there is a possible dotted line right connecting the two points and then uh, if that is there then you know the pathfinder is going to say uh, yes and you know there is no path is going to say no 
and of course in in uh, different uh, uh, complexities right for example if it is just uh, 32 by 32 or uh, 16 by 16 right 16 by 16 is your pathfinder and path x is the higher uh, uh, resolution uh, images right and if you see it interestingly right the transformers perform well on number of tasks right including your uh, list stops and uh, you know text classification text retrieval as well as image classification uh, so list stops is a, a long sequence processing task so which uh, uh, you know would, would uh, uh, be a series of uh, uh, you know a sequence of uh, uh, words which are saying for example take a modulus of the following numbers and then do um, uh, do addition and do other operations and so on, right? So the it, it kind of lists out the operations to be done, followed by the sequence of numbers on which they need to be done, right? And of course, it could be arbitrarily complex, and uh, so it, it may need, for example, a stack like uh, structure to process typically, right? So so on uh, that task, if you see, right, the transformers perform reasonably well, right? Thirty six uh, is what their score is compared to um, a chance right which will be just a 10 percent uh, score uh, whereas in the case of text classification right transformers do perform well and uh, you know they, they are way above the uh, uh, chance uh, uh, performance and in text retrieval also they do perform well but if you notice right the path x is a case where transformers most transformers right uh, are failing so like I discussed, right, this is the case when, um, you know, it's a complex uh, um, path from a point to another point in the image. And if that path is there, transformers learn it and they are able to identify if the path is there or not. Uh, but but most transformers fail in this task. So, um, so if, if, for example, uh, you know, people want to do research and you know, one of the open questions is, uh, you know, to, to solve the path is, uh, um, uh task right with uh, transformers and that's an open question and if you can do that then um, you know you may end up with a new rips or a, a iclr kind of paper right so so yeah th that's something that i want to talk about so this benchmark is very interesting and uh, of course the references given right there people can take a look and uh, see for yourself right uh, what happens and of course there is a blog also right which one of the authors of the paper that i uh, cited in the previous slide uh, he has the blog and uh, mustafa is his name so he has the um, way of putting the um, the you know the score across all of these tasks so we did see five different tasks right so which is the list stops the uh, text classification text retrieval image classification and pathfinder right so these scores are kind of aggregated and there is one score known as the LRA score. And then uh, how uh, it, it uh, you know, different transformers, uh, you know, what score they get versus, you know, the speed at which they have processed it, right? So that's the kind of thing you're seeing on this slide, right? And you see that, uh, for example, something like a big bird is able to get a high score and, uh, but however, speed is uh, low, right? And, and uh, those which uh, are, are able to process a lot of uh, examples, right, may not have a very high LRA score, right? So the trade-off is always there, right? Um, so, so we will also look at some limitations of AI, right? Before we kind of wind up, um, I know we have like uh, uh, maybe five minutes, I'll try to close out so that we'll uh, reserve the last 10 minutes for questions. Um, so, so the just wanted to briefly talk about some of the limitations that are there. So it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, AI has been, uh, uh, you know, doing well on very specific tasks uh, and, and beyond that specific task, right? AI will have a lot of limitations and uh, it cannot uh, uh, make sense out of situations, right? And if, if there is a slight uh, perturbation in the data or, you know, uh, in the assumptions made, uh, they, they may not perform well. So, for example, the complication is evident, for example, that uh, even the identity function, right, it uh, finds it difficult to um, generalize, right, outside of the training example, right, uh, the, the uh, AI has uh, difficulty with understanding the, just the identity function. And of course, there are um, um, 
recent uh, efforts that have also uh, shown up some of these limitations, right? For example, the DALI E, right? Is uh, um, uh, DALI is one of the uh, recent uh, uh, image uh, uh, generating, uh, you know, from text, uh, you know, so the software, if you just give a text, right, saying that, can I have an astronaut riding a horse? It goes and looks at all the images and uh, generates this image. So this image is actually generated by a system. Uh, so it's actually amazing that it's able to generate, you know, understand the text and generate the image. But but the uh, point is that the limitations are there in terms of, uh, for instance, if I were to flip and say that instead of a horse riding astronaut, can we say, can we, you know, can we give the input as uh, can you come up with uh, uh, a horse riding on an astronaut and then uh, the system kind of fails and you know it's, it's not able to understand the difference between these two and uh, has a lot of those kind of limitations right so it kind of points out that um, um, uh, right that um, uh, you know so so the uh, there are still limitations in terms of language that uh, the, the systems actually understand and how to correlate the language with the images, right? Th those are uh, areas where AI does have limitations, right? Um, so, so for instance, uh, in, in uh, images themselves, right? There are, though we have seen that in, in image processing, uh, you know, the, the deep learning networks especially, right? Do perform very well, right? But the one of the famous transformers known as GPT, right? Which is from the open AI, Obviously, no uh, offense uh, meant for uh, uh, you know uh, for OpenAI because OpenAI have done a lot of work in this space. But however, the the there are uh, gross limitations of the GPT, right? For example, the the images, right, of uh, um, some of these you see, right, on the first row, where it classifies quite well, right, because those are the images that are appearing. In the first column, right, they are appearing in the right place and in the right way, but the the next columns are all you know where the images are perturbed and uh, you know or or maybe you know there is a bus which is uh, uh, overthrown and you know lying on the you know lying uh, in in a different direction and all that, right? And in those cases, right, the uh, AI is going to misclassify the image, right? For example, in the case of uh, uh, you know, this image, right? It calls it a punching bag and the bus, uh, uh, the overturned bus, right? It's uh, calling it a snowplow, right? And then similarly, right? There are many of these images, right? Where AI kind of misclassifies the same, right? And, um, you know, it calls it a parachute and bobsled and whatnot, right? So um, this is, of course, Google Inception classifier, which is uh, again, a state of art classifier, right? From Google. Um, so, so we see, right, there are, uh, again, limitations in terms of uh, bias as well, right, where um, uh, we, we are noticing, right, that even some of the top companies, right, uh, their uh, tools, uh, you know, there's, th th those tools are showing some bias, right, it could be bias against women or uh, bias uh, um, with respect to people of color and so on, right, so these limitations are well known, right, so I won't delve into those, right. So quickly, right, uh, the, the possibilities is what I wanted to talk about, right, where um, I know I have to skip some slides because in the interest of time, I just want to wind up. So yeah, there is a recent work known as Gato, right, from uh, Google, which is interesting, where they are looking at, uh, you know, uh, leveraging transformers for different tasks. So typically what we saw is, right, the um, AI is good at very specific tasks, but then whereas if you use the same AI to solve multiple tasks, then it may not perform very well. But they've actually taken this ghetto and shown that, you know, across, uh, you know, different tasks and, uh, you know, the, they have trained it and made sure right, that it performs well um, across multiple tasks, maybe, you know, image classification and text processing and so on, right? Different kind of tasks they've taken and shown that, right, the AI does perform well. So this interesting work, and again, you will see uh, the, the graph neural nets as well as deep reinforcement learning with alpha go right um, th those are uh, interesting directions to take right and to kind of uh, close out right there are uh, um, 
various ways in which, uh, for example, the uh, transformers could be augmented, right? And one of them is, uh, for example, with symbolic reasoning. See, symbolic reasoning has been, for example, the um, starting point for many AI systems, right? AI systems started with symbols. And of course, there was a, a, the, the neural computing school, which was different. But one of the first schools was the symbolic reasoning school of AI. So kind of uh, being able to reason with uh, uh, some of these, right? So for instance, one of the things that is possible is to... Um, for instance, look at some of the sentences generated by the transformers like GPT, and then uh, you know reason with those, and then say that uh, you know we can reason and pick out only those which are making sense, right? In in uh, maybe uh, you know using common sense or other forms of reasoning, right? So that is what is possible, and uh, you know, they, this may give rise to some interesting work because uh, generally, right, there may be limitations in terms of what are the candidate sentences that, uh, for example, a GPT or other transformers may generate? Whereas, uh, you know, if you combine with reasoning systems, right, symbolic reasoning systems, then you may pick up uh, only those sentences which are appropriate, right, from uh, uh, your, your reasoning point of view. So that could be interesting uh, uh, track to take, right, for future work. So kind of uh, want to close with that and... Um, leave you with this thought, right, which is from Gary Marcus. So Gary Marcus has been a, a great researcher and uh, he is in, from the University of New York. And he kind of has been a critic of uh, um, uh, deep learning, but then uh, he's also done a lot of work, but the his criticism is mostly, you know, towards uh, uh, calling it general intelligence and saying, right, that we are achieving artificial general intelligence and all that, right? So that's where he... Um, says there are limitations and we shouldn't call it AJA, a, you know, a, a artificial general intelligence and uh, just call it machine intelligence is fine, but then calling it AJI and saying, but there are a lot of limitations, right? Because see, primarily, right, the uh, reasoning behind those is that the, uh, for example, even a child, right, has um, so much of background knowledge and, you know, basic knowledge and, for instance, understands basic physics, right, that something dropped will fall to the ground and, uh, you know, things like that, right, which uh, th those are very difficult for systems to actually understand those, right. Um, so, so, and of course, keeping in mind the uh, abstraction, compositionality and things like that, right. So, uh, th those are things which, uh, you know, can be looked at, as well as, like I said, uh, combining with reasoning techniques and uh, being able to handle uncertainty and incomplete information and so on, right? Those uh, will, will result in uh, better uh, uh, or, or what's known as richer cognitive models of the world, which can then help us build better uh, AI systems and go closer towards the what's known as artificial general intelligence. So with that, I kind of uh, close and uh, thanks folks for attending this session and we'll be glad to take questions. So let's see. What are the questions that have come up on the chat? So let's um, look at those first. Um, yeah, hi Vijay. That was a really good session. Beautiful session. Uh, I hope that uh, I did a uh, value to all the uh, participants. Okay, let, let's go on to the question. Uh, first question. Uh, can you see the chat, uh, Q and A section, Jay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. The first question is, uh, what does N cross K contain? Uh, I can see the rows, but what's there in the column? Yeah, it's just that how the words are getting related to each other, right? So you are uh, trying to look at um, uh, relations between the words. So if they are related, then you put a one there, and they are not related, you put a zero. So that's how you try to look at it. Um, so, so see, see the slides will be made available, right? I will try and um, um, put it out in some form, right? Maybe in a um, slide share or somewhere and uh, make it available to this audience. So we'll do that. Um, okay. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, answer your question, Jayati. Second question, do average school instead of X school work better if CNN is used for 10 classification? 
um see see the point there is is cnn if it is used for sentence classification max pool actually works well see the challenge is uh, uh, you know when a cnn has a limitation is when there are these what are called as long distance uh, dependencies right that's when cnn may have a limitation otherwise the max pool does work well see the challenge arises more in uh, image processing and like i said right where you are trying to look at uh, the the uh, where in the uh, image is the cat present right not whether a cat is present or not then that's where the spatial information is necessary and that that's when uh, you know you get into in, into trouble and again in the case of a text processing right the long uh, distance dependencies or long range dependencies that's when cnn will have trouble but otherwise yeah the the max pooling uh, does work well uh, the the average pooling right the challenge with that is uh, uh, see it, it may not work uh, you know when uh, uh, for instance there are significant words right which influence the sentiment or the classification right then if instead you are using the average then you wouldn't be able to identify those so so you may end up uh, misclassifying those right so that's a little bit of a challenge that's the reason max pooling has worked right but like i said only limitation is that in the case of long range dependencies that's where you know the the the, the cnn may have trouble and of course in images where uh, spatial information is necessary right um so yeah the the slides like i said will may, will be made available and yeah uh, back to you um okay uh, one last question when can improvisation such as twin transformers efficiency formers be called novelty in psp paper um see so see the uh a tough one but uh, see see many of them right the spin transformers as well as uh, your your others that we have seen right um, if you want i can go back to that slide because uh, it does capture some of them right so see here like you are uh, you know looking at right there are uh, uh, several of them right including the spin transformers and big bird and twin uh, transformers and what not right linformer and so so see many of them see can be considered as novelties themselves right see the point here is um, see while they may not be fundamentally different but they are incrementally novel right see in the sense that for example it provides a different way of implementing the transformer right see for example it may uh, use a sparse graph right graph processing and then implement transformers efficiently using those right so i think those are all valid uh, uh, you know as to be called as innovations for sure but only thing is uh, you know to be called as whether they are fundamentally different or not that is the only question right otherwise definitely right those are novel work right so definitely some of these right and and these uh, um don't forget that many of them right are published in uh, top conferences right including new rips and what not right so they are uh, novel without that they wouldn't be published in these top venues uh, of of ai right so there is novelty for sure right in uh, though it could be seen as incremental in the sense that they build on top of other work and are providing maybe a different way of implementing transformers efficiently but they are novel there are definitely novel uh, uh, ways of implementing it and which is what any of these papers actually address right um, so so yeah definitely there is novelty but whether they are fundamentally you know uh, different and all that that remains to be seen right so we'll kind of stop at that you know i hope that answered the question um, are there other uh, there, there are a lot of chats that have that i'm seeing Yeah, the vision uh, transformers. Then, which uh, we can answer separately, right? Yeah, vision transform would need to be a separate session by itself. Yeah, uh, we won't have time to cover those. Uh, 
there is one more question how to improve the architecture of transformers such as spin transformer efficient former and all yeah so so see um see many of the papers right in this slide uh, are actually attempts at improving the architecture of transformers right because they they like i said right maybe someone will look at a, a linear uh, uh, transformation of uh, the inputs and looking at that maybe some will do it using a sparse graph there are uh, specific uh, um, graphs that they use to address uh, you know the, the or provide a different way of implementing it and some of them will use for example signal processing techniques like fourier transforms to uh, you know which replaces the attention network so so that's how people are or looking at it right so the um, you know the, the attention network could be replaced with different things and then you are uh, experimenting with those so so yeah the, these are all in my view right attempts to improve the architecture right in uh, different forms and resulting in uh, uh, different kinds of architectures which uh, uh finally yeah they are transformers but yeah the the architecture is different in each of these and yeah just studying some of them will give you an idea of uh, you know what kind of architectural differences do exist in in many of these papers right so yeah i hope that addresses the uh, question um yeah okay. uh, we'll take one last question uh, with so many transformers is word still useful um see see the um i think it's a good question see because bert still is used see primarily to um see not just uh, um you know as a classifier or uh, in in other forms but primarily to kind of understand the context in which the words are occurring right so see primarily the bert has been pre trained on uh, for example your wikipedia data and all of that right so for example if a word like bank occurs it knows the context in which it is occurring and it's able to figure out that it's either a river bank or we are talking about a financial institution here so that it's able to figure out that part so lot of times the uh, bert is used as a feature extraction tool so you extract the essential features and then follow it up with uh, for example different kinds of transformers or maybe in our uh, traditional networks as well right like your um, uh, you know tree based networks or you know your uh, gbms and so on right for uh, classification and other tasks that you are solving right so um, so from that sense bert is still used as uh, maybe a feature uh, extractor or in some cases just to start with right people tend to use bert or uh, there are uh, variations of bird that have uh, uh, been tailored for uh, certain domains for example there is a legal bird that have, people have uh, uh, given which has been trained on legal data and then uh, there is a roberta so like that there are uh, different variations of bird which are still used uh, see only thing is those are not very efficient in terms of uh, their implementations and the order of n square complexity does apply so that's the limitation and that is where some of the work i have talked about right including these right including the diagram that we saw right the survey right those are addressing that limitation especially in on the implementation side right how can they be implemented more efficiently so from that sense right um, people are looking beyond bert but yeah people do start with bert in many real life applications and then uh, to maybe optimize implementation further they may look at other forms but yeah uh, bert is useful still yeah um, thank you for answering all those questions i hope the audience found it uh, helpful and uh, uh, now i'll uh, post a poll uh, i request everyone that the poll so that it will be helpful for uh, us in the future to conduct more uh, data analysis uh, in the meanwhile i think rishikesh has raised uh, his hand let me unmute him
hello yeah yeah you can be heard yeah hi rishikesh uh we have also posted the the uh, query link uh, which is editor at analyticsvidya.com you can reach out there if you want to conduct a webinar or if you have any problem in registering you can reach out there then uh, we have also posted the youtube link uh, for the channel uh, please the uh, Uh, visit the channel so that you can uh, uh, the recordings will be uploaded on this channel you can uh, watch it later and we are also posting the other sessions which will be conducted in the future which are uh, which will be conducted tomorrow uh, i hope uh, that that value to your uh, to the audience and uh, thanks once again vijay it was really wonderful session Hey thanks man absolutely thank you